I'm very honored to introduce our first plenary speaker, Farzad Sharifian. Actually, Farzad does not need an introduction as he's the man to establish cultural linguistics as an independent research paradigm on a global scale. I kept losing track of how many countries he visited during his Humboldt Fellowship at Potsdam University, all in the service of cultural linguistics. So most of you probably know Farzad in person and of his many achievements. Still, allow me to provide at least a brief sketch of his impressive portfolio. Farzad holds the chair of cultural linguistics, the first and only one of its kind so far, and is the director of the Language and Society Center at Monash University. He has published widely, one monograph, five edited volumes, and another one is in preparation. All of these books are milestones in cultural linguistics and were published by top-notch international publishing houses. He has also edited three special journal issues and some 60 articles and book chapters. Just have a look at the abstracts um, of this conference and you will see how influential Fazat's work is. Fazat's research also illustrates how broad the scope of cultural linguistics can be. He has applied cultural linguistics to areas such as world Englishes, pragmatics, English as a lingua franca, education, embodiment, and emotion, to name only some. Importantly, he has also advanced the field theoretically by defining terminology and developing a range of insightful concepts, just as um, uh, distributed cognition, to name but one important concept. Farzad is the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Language and Culture, editor of the Springer book series Cultural Linguistics, and co-editor with Ning Yu of the John Benjamin book series Cognitive Linguistic Studies in Cultural Contexts. He's also the president of the Applied Linguistics Association of Australia and has been awarded numerous prizes for research, teaching, and supervision. So in summary, Farzad is not only a great scholar, but also an immensely successful mover and shaker. Farzad, we're all ears for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans Georg, for uh, your kind and generous introduction. And yes, as my dear friend Hans Georg said, this is a historic conference, and these are historic moments. All I can say is that I have been waiting for a decade and a half to see a day where cultural linguistics has its own publishing venues, international conferences, and a scholarly fans such as yourself. It is the greatest pleasure of all times to see this day. And it is also a great pleasure to be the first speaker of the first international conference of cultural linguistics. Thank you all for being part of this growing family or community. In this talk today, I would like to answer the frequently asked questions that I get. What's the relationship between um, cultural linguistics and linguistic relativity? Are they the same? Where does cultural linguistics sit in relation to linguistic relativity? Um, this talk is based on a recently uh, accepted paper of mine, which will be published in the Journal of Language Sciences soon. So if you want the full version of the paper, you can email me and I can send it to you. Definition, linguistic relativity is commonly defined as the claim, this, these are the words of John Levitt, somewhere here. Um, the claim that the words your language gives you determine and limit what it is possible for you to think. Um, as John Levitt has put it, 
None of the actual proponents of linguistic relativity made such claims. On the contrary, no language they insisted puts limit on what it is possible to conceptualize while they continued to demonstrate a seductive power of established language patterns to offer easy to follow mental paths. Um, John admits that both Worf and Saper, the pioneers of linguistic relativity, indulged in some language that sounds highly deterministic. And it is these passages that are mostly, most frequently quoted. Um, perhaps uh, we could start with one of the uh, leading pioneers of linguistic relativity, Franz Boas, who was very much inspired by Humboldt in relation to the uh, question of language and culture. In one of the passages from um, Franz Boas, we see that he talks about a relationship between language and culture. The way he conceptualizes this relationship is that culture can mold language, but not language can mold culture. As you can see here, he says, it does not seem likely that there is any direct link between the culture of a tribe and the language they speak, except in so far as the form of the language will be molded by the state of the culture. So culture molding language, but not in so far as a certain state of culture is conditioned by morphological traits of the language. So for him, the direction is from culture to language. But of course, in his various writings, he's talked about you know, how language can reflect the psyche of a nation, for example. We go to Saper. Edward Saper, one of the uh, most influential linguistic anthropologists in the world and in the United States. Um, the Really, it's a bit difficult to analyze the works of these people, partly because they're no longer alive. We cannot go to them and say, What's, what did you think about this? Um, so for that reason, I encourage you to ask me questions while I'm alive. Um, um, the second one is that in different writings of these people, you see different um, inclinations. So that, that makes it difficult to just say what really this person thought. In a paper on the relationship between language and environment and culture, clearly Saper talks about how vocabulary, the lexicon, can reflect the cultural interests and the physical and the social environments of his speakers. We know this. For example, if in the, for Inuits in Canada, you know, the languages have got a lot of words for snow, for example, but in Arabic, you've got only one word for snow and ice. So language and, and um, particularly vocabulary can reflect the social and the physical environments of his speakers. I think that's not very controversial. Um, here is another quote from Saper. It is only very rarely, as a matter of fact, that it can be pointed out how a cultural trait has had some influence on the fundamental structure of a language. So you can see this is sort of a denial that culture has any influence on language. To a certain extent, this lack of correspondence may be due to the fact that linguistic changes do not proceed at the same rate as most cultural changes. Cultural changes are faster, probably, which are on the whole far more rapid. Again, he says, the vocabulary is a very sensitive index of the culture, of a people, and changes the meanings. Loss of old words, the creation and borrowing of new ones are all dependent on the history of culture itself. Now, we go to what is known as linguistic determinism. 
This is a highly frequently quoted text from Edward Saper. Language powerfully conditions all our thinking about social problems and processes. Human beings are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for the society. The fact of the matter is that the real world is to a large extent unconsciously built up on the language habits of the group. We see and hear, this is the quote that is always used to talk about linguistic determinism. We see and hear and otherwise experience very largely as we do because um, the language habits of our community predispose certain choices on our interpretation. I think that a mild version of this view is known as the thinking for speaking, Dan Slovin's thinking for speaking, that language tends to draw our attention to particular aspects of the environment more or experience more than others. All right. Um, this is a 1929 paper. I strongly believe people like Saper sets what they said depending on the purpose of the paper that they were writing. I do not really think he wrote this paper to express his views, but he was writing to say linguistics is science, to have a voice for people in other disciplines and saying linguistics is science, take us seriously. Look at here. It is the, but well, the title of the paper is the status of linguistics as a science. Probably we should give him credit because now in many parts of the world, linguistics is part of cognitive sciences, behavioral sciences, or social sciences. So it's taken seriously as a science, even as part of cognitive science. It is the main purpose of this paper not to insist on what linguistics has already accomplished, but rather to, appoint, to point out some of the connections between linguistics and other scientific disciplines. And above all, to raise the question in what sense linguistics can be called science. It is difficult for a modern linguist to confine himself to his traditional subject matter. Unless he's somewhat unimaginative, he cannot but share in some or all of the mutual interests which tie up linguistics with anthropology and cultural history, with sociology, with psychology, with philosophy, and more remotely with physics and physiology. So as much as this paper has been criticized um, as having a very strong um, view about the relationship between language and thought, I think it achieved what it was going to achieve. You know that a paper like this has generated a many hypotheses about the relationship between language, thought, and culture. People in psychology, anthropology, linguistics have done a lot of both theoretical and empirical research. And so whatever Saper thought about the relationship between language and thought doesn't really matter. What matters is that he managed to generate hypotheses and views that have been empirically tested over the years. I think we should give him credit for, uh, for this. Worf. Um, we usually hear this particular passage about his views. We dissect nature along lines laid by our native languages. We cut nature up, organize it into concepts, and ascribe significance as we do, largely because we're parties to an agreement to organize it in this way. An agreement that holds throughout our speech community and is codified in the patterns of a language. Now, so it sounds like you know, getting close to the idea that language really shapes our thinking and culture. Now, 
So what I'd like to do is to scrutinize these passages, particularly this one. Um, the first question that I have is terminological considerations. You can see here that he starts with um, the world has to be organized by our minds. And this means largely by the linguistic system in the mind. So this suggests that language organizes the mind. We cut nature up, which means categorize it through the categories provided to us by the language, which I think we all agree. Organize it, mental organization, by means of language or linguistic categories. What is this? It's a table. And ascribe significances as we do, largely because we are parties to an agreement to organize. Again, we're talking about mental organization. And then he talks about codification in the patterns of language. Now, if, 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 if we examine this carefully, we realize that he is talking about categorization, organization, and codification. Categorization, organization are not the same as perception. So some people say, well, he said, we cannot perceive the world other than through our language. No. In particular, in this text, there is no mention of perception. It is all about categorization and organization. So I think we have to be very careful not to confuse things and jump from, for example, organization in the mind to perception, that we cannot perceive the world um, otherwise through the lenses of our language. In a paper entitled An American Indian Model of the Universe, Worf says, just as it is possible to have any number of geomet geometries other than the Euclidean which give us equally perfect account of a space configuration, so it is possible to have descriptions of the universe all equally valid that do not contain our familiar contrast of time and space. So again, I think you know, part of the problem with these views is terminological imprecision, that they, they used any words that you know, came to their mind. What does configuration mean? What did he mean by configuration? Did he mean conceptualization? He talks about metaphysics. But when you read the text, really, it's the worldview of the Indians. Um, he says, at the same time, new concepts and abstractions flow into the picture, taking up the task of describing the universe without reference to such time and space. Abstractions for which our language lacks adequate terms. Again, concepts and abstractions. So configurations, concepts, and abstractions. What did he mean by these? Did he mean conceptualization? So part, part of the problem is this, is the terminological um, imprecision. That, okay, you use a term, you define it, and then people understand what you mean by that. If we take those words to mean conceptualization, then I can paraphrase Worf in this way. Different languages may rely on different conceptual systems. And that these conceptualizations may be, but not always, will always be, consistent with an underlying worldview associated with the language. A very good example is in Aboriginal English in Australia, 
you hear a sentence, this land is me, instead of this land is mine. Well, this land is me is consistent with a particular worldview in which the speaker conceptualizes the land as a place where the ancestor beings created the land and they became part of the land. And I'm part of my ancestor beings, therefore I am part of the land. This land is me rather than the worldview in which you possess the land, you sell it, you give it to children. So um, whether or not the person holds this worldview anymore doesn't matter, but that linguistic expression is consistent with a particular underlying worldview. I don't think this is very much controversial. And as I have said here, this worldview, however, could be a carryover from an earlier time. Worf observes that conceptualizations that are encoded in language reflect the model that a particular worldview imposes upon the universe. Remember, we're talking about a worldview that is imposed upon a universe rather than the speakers. This does not suggest that it is the language that imposes this frame of thinking onto the speaker. Again, I repeat, language reflects the model that a particular worldview imposes upon the universe. In, I went through the whole article. He does not talk about the speaker even once, but elaborates on the features of the Hopi language and discusses them in relation to the Hopi worldview, language and the Hopi worldview. Again, this does not suggest that the language imposes certain structures on the speakers themselves. Or, or speakers are imprisoned in the um, house of the language. I think Worf's main argument uh, is just a deeper understanding of certain features of the Hopi language requires an understanding of the worldview associated with the language. I don't think this is very controversial. I'll give you an example myself. And without knowing the underlying Hopian metaphysics, he says metaphysics, I say a worldview, it would be impossible to understand how the same suffix may denote um, starting or stopping. An example of that view is, is this one, that Worfian claim. Noun classes in one of the Aboriginal languages in Australia called Murrinpatha. Um, there are 10 noun classes. And so every noun takes one of these noun classifiers. One of them is Aboriginal people and human spirits. One is non-Aboriginal people and other animates and their products. One is language. One is uh, fire and thing, so things associated with fire. Now, it's fair to say that if you don't understand the underlying worldview associated with this language, you don't understand why you have these noun classifiers. Why do you have a noun classifier for speech and language and associated concepts such as song and news? Why do you need one particular? Because in the underlying worldview associated with this language, language is very important. People even are called, um, they get they labels by their language. You are a Yamaji. That means you speak Yamaji. So this is a very um, you know, quick and um, easy example of how uh, certain features of the language uh, might reflect an underlying, world, an underlying worldview, whether or not that worldview is current or not. That's a different issue. Now we focus on the question of cultural linguistics versus linguistic relativity. I've got three points to make. First of all, challenge of the notion of culture. 
for linguistic relativity. Terminological imprecision, which I have already discussed, and the question of theoretical analytical framework versus theory or theory complex or hypothesis. I think Hans Georg uh, covered the whole issue that culture has become almost a taboo in certain circles. As Dwight Atkinson, in one of the chapters in the Handbook of Language and Culture that I edited, uh, puts it, the very field of anthropology that started looking at culture almost abandoned, half abandoned the term culture. And why? We all know why. Because some people started to use the word culture in essentialist ways. Ten things you know, need to know about Arabs. That's it. Five things about, you know, Italians. And so people have started you know, to react to these stereotypical statements and they associate culture with that. So that's one of the challenges for linguistic relativity. Um, to, to rectify, I think, this problem, cultural linguistics has been very clear that cultural linguistics is a multidisciplinary paradigm or framework or discipline that studies the relationship between language and cultural conceptualizations, not culture. Language and cultural conceptualizations, by which we're talking about cultural schemas, cultural metaphors, cultural categories. So we are very specific what we're talking about, rather than the very broad and abstract notion of culture. So, again, a challenge for linguistic relativity is where they use the term culture, metaphysics, worldview, as if they're interchangeable, so they don't have really um, analytical tools, or they probably didn't have the time to develop. Uh, they were not as patient as I was, probably, to you know, start developing these analytical uh, tools. I told you the word configuration, not sure what it means. I don't think they used it in a technical sense. We use it in, in cultural linguistics. We use the technical term conceptualization, and we know what we mean by that. John Lucy um, says, true accounts of linguistic relativity acknowledge a distinctive role for language structure in interpreting experience and influencing thought. Again, John uses the word interpreting. So what does interpret mean? Perception or conceptualization? Um, organization, categorization, or all of them? So I think John falls into the same trap by using just a layman term, interpreting experience. For uh, when you read the uh, writings of the pioneers of linguistic relativity, you really see sometimes they just view language as grammar and sometimes as they acknowledge vocabulary, then vocabulary reflects uh, you know, social organization or, or, or environment or culture. But language is more than just vocabulary and grammar. And this is, I think, what cultural linguistics acknowledges. It subscribes to a view of language, that language is from syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, discourse structure, and ex examines all these features of language and levels of language to see how they might be associated with certain cultural conceptualizations. And I think that's, that's one of the issues, really, with many circles of, of um, linguistics, um, starting with generative linguistics. As we know, you know, Chomsky was trying to say, semantics has got nothing to do with um, syntax. I'm interested in syntax. That very famous sentence, 
um, green, greenless ideas asleep furiously or something. Colorless green ideas asleep furiously. So he was trying to separate semantics from syntax. So um, in cultural linguistics does not do that. It sort of um, acknowledges a view of language that is very comprehensive. Cultural linguistics has a, a particular theoretical framework. It starts with the notion of cultural cognition. The notion of cultural cognition is very much in line with recent views of cognition that go beyond what we call between the ear view of cognition. The Western psychology puts cognition between the two ears of speakers. We go beyond that. Cultural cognition is a more collective, emergent, complex, adaptive um, system. The theoretical framework of cultural linguistics explains the relationship between cultural conceptualizations and language, defines cultural conceptualizations, and um, elaborates on the relationship between language, cultural conceptualizations, and cultural cognition. I don't want to go deep into the theoretical aspects. Of course, um, there are um, writings where I and others have elaborated on this issue. The analytical framework of cultural linguistics um, focuses on cultural conceptualizations and language and tries to identify the features of human languages from morphosyntactic to semantic and pragmatic meaning. I'm not trying to separate pragmatic and semantic meaning. In cultural linguistics, we, we believe that semantic, pragmatic meaning are not a dichotomy. Um, they are points on a spectrum. Uh, how these features of human languages are entrenched or reflect underlying cultural conceptualizations such as cultural schemas, cultural categories, and cultural metaphors, which I have recently called cross-domain conceptualizations. Because really some cases of metaphors are metaphors for the outsider to the speech community, but just simply cross-domain conceptualizations for insiders. So in a nutshell, this is the combination of the theoretical as well as the analytical framework of cultural linguistics. We have the analytical tools. Here, cultural schemas, cultural categories, cultural metaphors. And then at a higher level, we have the theoretical framework that focuses on the relationship between cultural conceptualizations, language, and cultural cognition. Now, so the consequences of terminological imprecision. This is again from John sitting at the back, John Levitt. He says, psychological research reduced language to vocabulary and reduced thought to cognitive processes such as memory and recognition. So during 1950s and 60s, um, Worf achieved, Sapir Worf achieved what they wanted to achieve. They were taken seriously by a number of psychologists. So what psychologists do, they, as soon as, you know, someone like Chomsky or um, Sapir Worf, they've got ideas, they try to turn these ideas into testable hypotheses. They formulate experiments. However, as John elegantly says, they reduced, because they're not linguists, they're psychologists, they reduced language to just vocabulary and thought to just cognitive processes. And again, as John says, not surprisingly, the findings of most psychologists in this domain in the 1950s and 1960s were either ambiguous or clearly negative. 
these studies ignored conceptualizations of experience, which is the focus of cultural linguistics. So cultural linguistics does not claim that it focuses on cognitive processing, although I must admit that in several studies that we conducted, um, for example, in a series of studies that I conducted with my former supervisor, Professor Ian Malcolm, who's sitting there, we got Aboriginal children to listen to some stories, Western stories, and we asked them to repeat those stories. When they repeated those stories, they brought some elements like a spirituality that were not part of the original stories. This shows that in their cognitive processing, they are relying on their cultural schemas. They understand these Western stories in the light of their own cultural schemas. They re-schematize um, the stories into their own cultural schemas. So um, there are studies that clearly show how these cultural conceptualizations can affect cognitive processing. So if we can um, conduct research that shows something about cognitive processing, so be it. But I think the main focus of cultural linguistics is really on any method, any data that can give us clues about the relationship between language and cultural conceptualizations. As Hans Georg said, I have tirelessly traveled throughout Europe in the last two months. God knows how many countries I have gone to giving talks. Some of you hosted me uh, from Budapest to um, Thessaloniki in um, Greece, um, in um, the Netherlands, where else? Potsdam, Berlin, um, Freiburg, Heidelberg, uh, Bern, Paris. So you can imagine how tired I am. Uh, some people ask me about the question of methodology. And I say, I think as far as I'm concerned, any method, any data collection procedure that can give us clues about the relationship between language and cultural conceptualizations, we should adopt it. Um, I dare say something about my former life here. I was a psycholinguist a very hardcore psycholinguist. I did a PhD in psycholinguistics. I worked with laboratories, you know, um, prime, priming, reaction time measurement. What we used to do, or I used to do in my former life, we don't start with the question. We have the methodology, then we ask a question that can be answered by this methodology. You don't ask a question that cannot be a answered by this methodology, all right? Whereas in cultural linguistics, we do the opposite. We start with the question, a question that intrigues you. I heard one of our student helpers who is sitting there wants to work on conceptualizations and bread in Bosnia. Am I right? Intriguing conceptualizations of bread. Yes, bread can be used as a metaphor for make a living. Spiritually, I, I have been places where people have got spiritual views about, of course, you know that in also Christianity. So that, that's it. You know, you, you're having breakfast and all of a sudden you think, well, what, why not, you know, looking at conceptualizations of bread? Yeah, we have people here looking at conceptualizations of wine. And we have imported wine from Australia because Tuscany doesn't have a wine. <laughs> I didn't do it. One of the speakers has done it. But so someone asked me about, again, me methodology. I'm writing, actually, at the moment, I'm writing a chapter on methodology. 
or a paper on methodology in cultural linguistics. And my answer was, we start with principles rather than procedures. Keep that in mind. Principles rather than procedures. The principle is, for example, that a conceptualization need to be explored from the insider perspective as well as the outsider perspective, the etic versus the emic perspective. Um, you need to go to the history sometimes to see how certain conceptualizations, where do they come from? Um, with a PhD student of mine, recently we looked at the happiness in Persian, and in order to understand one of the morphemes in happiness, we had to go back to the proto-Indo-Iranian religion, which dates back before Zoroastrianism, to find out what it meant. It meant a god for fortune. And now, a lot of people talk about happiness in terms of uh, your fortune, predestined fortune, particularly in the case of marriage. But we also look at interviews, focus groups. So anything from any discipline that can give us clues about a particular conceptualization. I had to go and read text in theology, in history. So this is the openness of cultural linguistics. Some of you know how um, sensitive I am about classifying cultural linguistics under particular disciplines. And I think, as far as I'm concerned, cultural linguistics is very open and You've got the bread, you might go into religious texts to find out something about that particular conceptualization. Historical linguistics, whatever, gives us clues. Linguistic relativity and the notion of distributedness. I think, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as I can tell in the texts, um, linguistic relativity appears to view them as homogeneously shared, the culture of a people. That's what Sapir says, the culture of the people, the language of the people. Whereas in cultural linguistics, we view cultural cognition, cultural conceptualizations, and language as heterogeneously distributed. One of my PhD students, Tahmineh, who is sitting at the back, she's looking at how this notion of heterogeneous distribution in Persian accounts for variation among speakers in terms of impoliteness. So in fact, this notion of heterogeneous distribution is serving as a kind of explanatory mechanism or structure for explaining variation within a particular speech community. This is something Remember, variation belonged to which discipline? Sociolinguistics. But they were really focusing on variation, which was due to social factors. But we also have variation in cultural conceptualizations. We acknowledge that and we explore that. What is impolite for a particular speaker is polite for a different particular speaker. It is because of different they're different internalizations of cultural conceptualizations. And we explore this. So this is one of the differences between cultural linguistics and linguistics relativity. Choice versus imprisonment. This is a quote from Professor Rosalind Frank sitting right here. The paradigm emerging from research in cultural linguistics draws on a highly nuanced, multidisciplinary, informed approach that allows for a greater appreciation of individual choices and the motivations behind these choices as they coalesce into and around cultural conceptualizations. So, whereas the strong versions of linguistic relativity did not allow for speakers' choices. We do acknowledge that in cultural linguistics. We treat language and cultural cognition as dynamic systems. We call them 
complex adaptive systems, emergent systems, dynamic systems. I don't want to go too much into the theory here, but um, we have discussed them in our writings. And we, we believe that language and cultural cognition are dynamic systems that interact with each other in very complex ways. Now, Wolf and Holmes um, provided a chart which nicely shows the number of hypotheses, subclasses of hypotheses um, that have emerged um, from linguistic relativity. So as you can see, more than 20 hypotheses have emerged from linguistic relativity. Um, I think one of the issues that is crucial here before I conclude is um, do we have testable hypotheses for cognitive psychology? We may or we may not. In particular research that I conducted with Ian, we sometimes manage to have really questions that could be empirically examined. But in general, I think um, this is another question that is cultural linguistics a theory? Is it a hypothesis? Is it a framework? Is it a paradigm? Well, as far as I'm concerned, I am, I am in my former life, I was uh, very much into philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, and I extensively read the work of people like um, Carl Raymond Popper and um, you know, people of that caliber. I'm very cautious not to call cultural linguistics as a, as a theory in the hardcore science sense of the world or hypotheses. But for me, it is a paradigm. It provides a theoretical framework, an analytical framework. So um, we want to be very clear from the beginning, it's not a beginning, but from here, that uh, this is our message to psychologists. Please do not turn our ideas into experiments and then come back and say, you know, your ideas did not um, work. Um, all right. I think on that note, I'd like to come to a concluding remarks. I think linguistic relativity has generated a rather large number of hypotheses about the relationship between language and thought. Excuse my typo here, but hypotheses. Um, cultural linguistics, on the other hand, focuses on exploring the relationship between language and cultural conceptualizations offering a theoretical as well as an analytical framework, and some accounts of linguistic relativity share the interest of cultural linguistics in examining the relationship between language and conceptualizations that are culturally constructed. I very much hope that I have provided a fair account of linguistic relativity here and not do injustice to that. And on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for your listening.